Good morning, I'm Jared Montgomery. I'm the co-course director for the Coffee Kids and Sports Medicine Series. I'd like to thank you for joining us this morning. Early on in the COVID-19 stay at home window, several research teams at Scottish Rite recognized the potential risk for children. In each of their areas of expertise, these st study teams developed parent and child surveys to assess the impact on physical activity and psychological well-being in our children. Today, we'll hear from lead investigators on the current state of each of these studies, and we'll close with a panel discussion and questions. For the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and present uh, or introduce our presenters today ahead of time. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Kirsten Tolchin Francis who is the Division Director of our Movement Science, which has laboratories on both our Dallas and Frisco campuses. With a background in biomedical engineering, her research interests focus on the use of quantitative methods to assess movement strategies in children with and without sports injuries and other orthopedic conditions. Uh, SARS coronavirus 2 and the COVID-19 disease really don't need any introduction on its own. Uh, in a very short seven months, uh, it's spread all around the world. There's very few places left that haven't been affected. Um, as the uh, coronavirus swept across uh, Asia and Europe, we had an opportunity to mediate in America and um, take some action to flatten the curve. And in that process, uh, many uh, counties and, and local municipalities, as well as states, instituted uh, shelter-in-place orders and social distancing. Um, obviously, as an institution that focuses on children, physical activity and peer interaction is very important in the development of, of, our, of our youth. And the impact of, of these shutdowns really are unknown. We know that for physical activity, children need to really have uh, about an hour of moderate to vigorous activity every day. Um, and uh, that activity is not only beneficial to their physical well-being, um, but also to their mental well-being. Um, physical activity has been linked to um, decreases with uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety. Um, plus, the social interaction of physical activity between peers also allows children for self-expression, self-confidence, social interaction, and that's a really important factor in how our children um, grow and develop healthy lifestyles. It's also been shown that children that develop healthy lifestyles at an early age can maintain those and often have healthier lifestyles as adults. So we know that there's this link between physical activity and mental health, um, and also, obviously, that social interaction part that comes in. So when we have shelter in place and we have social distancing, there were a lot of changes that went on, and you know, I think for us, at least, and our team, we never really anticipated that it was going to last so long. When we developed our survey, um, we were anticipating that the kids would be going back to school in the spring. So um, we know that, that these closures of, of our social interaction, um, our sports have been canceled, our physical activity, our um, just general um, environmental learning in schools, everything shut down. So what impact does that have on the mental health and well-being of our children and also their physical activity levels? So the coronavirus kind of came in like a cue ball and just split everything up. Um, there's a nice balance between these three things normally, and right now that's all out the window. So we really don't understand yet how this is going to impact our children, not only in the short term, which is really what we're looking at and we'll be talking about today, but in the long term as well. If there is one thing that shelter in place has, has done, it gave a lot of opportunity for um, manuscripts in the scientific literature. So there wasn't a lot of research to be done at that point. So early on, it was a lot of commentaries, it was a lot of editorials, um, a public opinion, expert opinion of maybe what we should and shouldn't be doing, what we should and shouldn't be researching, and what impact all this was going to have on the short term and the long term. But at this point in time, we really didn't have much to go on. Over the last month or two, there have been several studies that have started to come out looking at both mental health and physical activity. And there's also this other underlying fact of, in America, we have a, a large obesity issue, and physical activity and mental health are directly related to obesity as well. So you not only have issues of, of this pandemic, and the, but you also have this underlying um, problem with having already have a society that is decreased in sedentary behavior um, oftentimes. So that kind of leads us into our first survey, which um, our team put together. And I do want to say that this is a collaboration not only with Scottish Rite and UT Southwestern, but also collaborators at Texas Women's University, um, University of North Texas, and the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, 
Last summer, we actually did a pilot study looking at how kids play. As I said earlier, kids need 60 minutes of physical activity every day, and that's moderate to vigorous activity. And we know that playground play is really important socially, but we really didn't know how, how high of an activity level do they get. So last summer we did a pilot study, and there's been some literature out there that shows um, kids do tend to play more on playground equipment than in open fields if they're on their own and not playing a sport. Um, temperature is also obviously important. So we broke the playground down on our Dallas campus up into areas, and you can see A is kind of your typical playground, your unique features that we have specific at our playground, and then a, a free play area. And we were able to show the level of, uh, of um, intensity of exercise that children get on the playground. And what we were really hoping to do this summer was expand upon that and to look at some other factors about whether or not um, an adaptive or inclusive playground can give the same level of, of uh, exercise to those individuals who are typically developing and don't have underlying conditions. But unfortunately, our playgrounds were closed. So our team kind of spurred the moment on a phone call said, hey, you know what? Playgrounds are closed. What if we studied what kids are doing if they can't go to the playground? And that's really kind of how our, our survey kind of uh, started off. Um, so the purpose of our study is really to look at not only the child, but the family as well, and look at um, what access they have in the community to uh, play physical activity environments, and then identify what kind of strategies families have been using to either increase or maintain or at least minimally decrease um, the physical activity that they have. We know that for children, physical activity isn't just sports. It's kind of it comes from everywhere, but a lot, this is from the WHO guidelines, the World Health Organization, that for children, a lot of their exercise comes from physical education classes and then family, school, and community um, activities. And those were the activities that were shut down during shelter in place. So we really were interested in seeing how this impacted. So for our data collection, we created a parent-reported anonymous online survey. Um, they had to have one child between 3 and 18 living in their household. We did have it available in English and Spanish. Our main mode of um, of recruitment was actually through social media and then also what we call snowball um, recruitment which I actually had to learn about from the psychology team uh, which is basically you recruit somebody and then hopefully that person goes and spreads the word and before you know it you've got a whole bunch of people who have taken your survey. Um, so we collected data over eight and a half weeks. We originally were only planning on doing it for about a month but again school never went back in session. Um, that was an unfortunate part for us. We were really actually hoping to, to disseminate our survey through the school districts, and once things got shut down, they got overwhelmed with online learning, and we really weren't able to ever utilize that as an option to, to disseminate our survey. So our survey kind of comes in three parts. The consent is obviously part one. Uh, the part, second part is just household and community demographics, looking at not only the um, the family itself, but what they have in their local community. And then a single question on parental physical activity. And then the meat of our survey is really the parent report of the child's activities. So the child demographics. And then we have um, three different ways that we're looking at activity in the community. Uh, we do have uh, just a few questions that ask about child and parent adjustment, but really the psychology portion that was going to be with the psychology team in their survey. So we had uh, 1,696 surveys started. Um, obviously, with an online survey, you have some drop-off. So um, 1,300 households uh, uh, completed our household part of our survey. Um, and uh, that ran, ended up being 1,211 parent surveys now a for the child. Now, we did allow um, a repeat of the child. So they can actually just repeat the second half of the survey, not have to go all the way back if they had another child living in the household. So that ended up having almost 1,300 um, surveys completed um, for uh, the, ch the children. Uh, we actually also spread all across the United States. So uh, many of these states, we only got one or two, and that really wasn't enough to do anything with statistically. So we grouped it by zip code. So the first digit of the zip code, we made nine regions. Um, we decided to group uh, zones one and two simply because that was a pretty big hot spot at the time when we were passing it out, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey. Um, so we grouped all those together. And then five and eight uh, zip codes were grouped together just because those were a, a relatively small sample that we had collected. Um, obviously, we're in Texas, and we had about 55% um, or 60% of our surveys actually came from the state of Texas. So I'm just going to kind of jump in and give you an overall view of what our data is. We're still in the process of uh, analyzing a lot of our data, so I have some preliminary results to share today. But for the meat of it, we'll have to um, uh, pass that along at another time. 
So uh, we are a little bit uh, biased in our sample. So 91% came from single family homes in the suburban area. Um, many of the households had at least one parent who had had a college degree. I'd classify the majority of our survey respondents as middle or upper class. <clears throat> and uh, we actually wanted to have this question on there specifically for the schooling factor on whether or not they had broadband internet in their household, not on their phone. Cell phone uh, use was not, um, it was a separate question. Um, so out of that, we also had uh, about two thirds of our families that completed the survey had more than one child living in the house. And we also asked how many adults were living in the house. And I was surprised to see that um, multi-generational probably were uh, a good portion of our families where they had three or more adults in the household. Um, from the child perspective, we were pretty well split between boys and girls. <clears throat> we also had a question about whether or not the child had any kind of condition that might impact their mobility. Um, and we only had about 6% of our survey respondents uh, indicate that. Um, we were a predominantly Caucasian in terms of our uh, race, and we were 13% um, Hispanic um, ethnicity. So this is just a broad overview of age. Um, what we actually also collected was grade levels, so we kind of decided we would look at it in by grade instead of by age. So we have our pre-K, elementary school, middle school, and then high school age groups. And I do think there's going to be some significant differences in a lot of our results, um, and I'll share those as we go. Um, based on age. So first one we look at is what their community and environment look like. So these were questions that they are asking whether or not they agreed with the statement or not. So the first question, for example, was do you have uh, neighborhood sidewalks and are they well maintained? And 70% said yes. Uh, only 40% had access to local bike paths though. Uh, most had pre-COVID access to local um, facilities for organized sports and recreation. And most reported that they had active neighbors and lived in a neighborhood where um, there wasn't a lot of crime and it was safe to exercise in their neighborhood. We also wanted to ask um, how much people in their household used that compared to before the pandemic. Um, and what we found was that most 50% uh, were saying, uh, or more, were actually stating that they get out and exercise more in their community using those sidewalks and the community bicycle pass. And obviously because facilities were closed and sports were canceled, there were really uh, limited uh, access to those um, activities. Uh, the parent physical activity was really just one question. Uh, rate yourself on a scale of zero to 10 on uh, your activity level um, before the pandemic and then within the last seven days. And what we found was a pretty normal distribution that actually evened out to about zero. So there was actually no change statistically between their pre and their post, but you can see there were some that clearly in indicated they increased activity and some that decreased. That kind of washed out a little bit. For the child, we asked um, a specific questionnaire. This is a leisure time questionnaire that gets at how many uh, times a week they do at least 15 minutes of strenuous, moderate, and mild activity. And what we found was there was a significant decrease in physical activity in children um, from before the pandemic to during the pandemic, during shelter in place. But more specifically, we were able to look at those three parts of that. So strenuous and moderate activity both decreased. And remember, that's what the kids need. They need moderate to vigorous activity 60 minutes a day. And those are the two areas that are actually decreasing. There was no difference in the mild um, uh, or, or low intensity exercise. Um, organized sports, and I know Dr. Ellis is going to be speaking um, in his survey about specifically about athletes uh, and, and sports. 78% uh, of our respondents did indicate they participated in some sort of organized sport or recreation pre-COVID, and then during COVID, 78% of those were canceled. So only 10% were actively participating at the time of the survey. Uh, and then this was the last question that we really asked about physical activity, and it's kind of broken up into two parts. So it asked about where they did their physical activity and who they did it with. So we had outside, in your backyard, in your neighborhood, in your community, and then we had inside, child-led activity, parent-led activity, or online activity. And then we asked, well, who did you do it with? Did you do it alone, with a sibling, with a peer? Um, and so what I'm going to show you now is kind of the change from pre to post. So the green dots basically indicate that they did that more. Uh, so we can see that across all aspects, the kids were more independent in their activity um, in all the different areas. 
Um, they obviously were playing less with friends because they were social distancing and sheltering in place and not having those play dates. So that was decreased in all of the categories. And then in terms of their family, um, you can just see really uh, right across that community, again, where all those facilities were closed, you see less community activity. We had one else, uh, last section that talked about educational activities. Um, and we just broke it down into three sections, written activities, electronic activities, and then fine art activities. And kind of the same factor, did you do it by yourself, did your parent help you, or did you do it online? And here we find that writing activities actually increased online, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and you're going to see a trend here. Um, electronic activities, obviously, those were also being um, generated on, online, either live or with a video. And then <clears throat> the fine art activities as well. So I did find this interesting. I know as a parent myself, um, it was a bit stressful. I have a kindergartner, and it's hard to do um, homeschooling with a kindergartner when you've never been a parent or a teacher before. So I did find it interesting that the online activities were much higher frequency than the, uh, than the parent-led activities in our survey. And again, we only asked a couple of questions here. Um, just generally speaking, uh, my child's activities were altered, uh, agree or disagree, and uh, my child's role or my parent, uh, the parent's role has changed. So obviously life has changed for everybody during pandemic. Um, we also asked if the relationship between the parent and the child or the child and their siblings changed. And this was really a question of um, what impact that might have on family dynamics. And we didn't get into that in our survey. Um, I think maybe the psychology team will have more insight into that. And then lastly, we just asked on a scale of 1 to 10, how well did you think your child um, transitioned to social distancing and um, shelter in place, if that was an order for you? And there was no difference um, between their scores there. Um, we did ask also, rate right on a scale of 0 to 10, your stress level and your child's stress level. And they did rate their own stress level as a parent higher than their child's. So for our next step, we have a lot of questions and a lot of data to look at. So we want to know how an impact of siblings and the number of adults in a household, how that effect has on physical activity. Um, we want to obviously look into the socioeconomical um, the correct, uh, um, criteria that we've collected, um, knowing that our sample is skewed in a certain direction, and really what is the effect of age and, and sex on our um, child activity levels as well. So our take home message is, is at this point, social distancing and shelter in place um, has definitely led to a decrease in reported physical activity in our American youth. I will also tell you, we have a second study that was a small sample of about 40 kids that we actually gave wearable sensors to uh, during shelter in place and actually collected quantitative data on. And we're just now analyzing that data as well. So we'll have their survey and we will also have quantitative data to show whether or not their, ex their, their um, exercise level has decreased. Um, also, the families that we uh, surveyed increased their use of the green space and bike trails as fitness centers and uh, organized sports were canceled. So there's definitely been a shift in that guard. Now the issue is this is Texas and it's going to get hot. So what can we do to increase our physical activity and stay safe during COVID? Well, I think the biggest part as a parent and as an adult in the community is to lead by example. Um, I think you know it's, studies have shown that in, when parents are active, kids tend to be more active. Um, be creative, you know, it's going to get hot. We know that it's Texas, the 100 degree weather is here. So try out some free online classes if you have to. Online seemed to work really well for educational, but we didn't see that increase in online activity for physical. But there are options out there if we need to use those. Um, obviously, continue to be uh, a good participant in the community and practice social distancing, good hand hygiene. And also, another thing to remember is make sure you sanitize your equipment at home, especially if there's multiple people using them. You want to make sure you clean that regularly. As healthcare workers and providers, what can we do? Basically two things, stay informed, follow your local state and national guidelines uh, for social distancing and whether uh, other uh, guidelines are in fact uh, in place at that time, but be an advocate. Um, be an advocate for yourself, for your family, and for your patients. Help educate um, the community on what we can do and how we can help uh, to be safe, but be active at the same time. I just really want to thank our entire team. As I said, this is a multidisciplinary group um, with folks from uh, multiple institutions. So thank you very much for your time.